Hello, everybody, and welcome to one more day in pre-calculus with trigonometry. Uh, we're going to round out the week this week um, by building on what we did in our last class, as we always do. Um, in our last video, uh, we talked mostly about um, power functions, powers of x, x raised to a number, right? Uh, and what are some of the different uh, properties what are some of the different properties that functions have uh, that are just built on single building block powers of x? Uh, and so just to refresh uh, your memory of what we talked about in that uh, class is any function that is a single power of n, defined by an expression that uses a single power of x, rather. Um, they all have this behavior in common. When that is a positive integer power, so if n is greater than or equal to 1, all of those graphs pass through the origin, so f of 0 is always equal to 0, um, and they always have the same end behavior, that as x tends to positive infinity, f of x also tends to positive infinity. So it blows up to positive infinity when x does. And as x goes to minus infinity, the left end of the graph, um, f of x is either going to blow up to positive infinity when n is even, or negative infinity when n is odd. And then we were able to take that and turn it inside out, replacing x by 1 over x um, to get the same results for negative integer powers of x. So if n is less than or equal to, um, I guess less than or equal to negative 1, this should say, um, those functions don't pass through the origin because in fact they're undefined at the origin. They're undefined when x is equal to 0 um, because we can't take the reciprocal of 0. And x, sorry, 0 raised to a negative power is the same as the reciprocal of 0 raised to a positive power. So we can't do that. The domain is different. But they all, all the negative integer powers of x have that in common. <clears throat> they have in common that as x goes out to infinity, f of x goes down to 0. So they have this horizontal asymptote behavior toward the x-axis as uh, x approaches positive infinity, and also as x approaches negative infinity. And it's as x approaches 0 that these functions approach plus and minus infinity. They approach a vertical asymptote at the y-axis. Uh, so as x approaches 0 from the right, all of these functions approach the y-axis uh, toward positive infinity. And as x approaches 0 from the left, these functions either also approach positive infinity in the case of an even negative integer power of x, or they approach negative infinity in the case of an odd integer power of x, odd negative integer power of x. So all of our power functions had those things in common. And so what we want to do today is we want to take the next step and ask the question, now that we know what individual powers of x behave like when it comes to their sort of function behavior, what happens if I start mixing different powers of x together in the same function, the same expression that defines a function? Uh, and when we do that, we get a class of functions called polynomial functions. And that is the main uh, thing we want to talk about today. So on our agenda that's underneath, uh, we want to talk, first of all, about what are some of the key features that polynomial functions have? What kinds of questions can we answer that are, some of them, quick to answer? Uh, and some of them might take a little bit more doing to answer. Uh, but what are some of those key features? Uh, I want to talk some about the fundamental theorem of algebra and what the fundamental theorem of algebra is going to tell us about polynomial functions. Um, we'll talk about the end behavior once again. So what do polynomial functions in general do as x approaches positive infinity, so as we go to the eastern horizon of the xy plane, or as x approaches negative infinity and we go to the westernmost horizon of the xy plane? What does the end behavior of a polynomial function look like? Um, how many turning points, that's a new piece of vocabulary we're going to use today, how many turning points does the graph of a polynomial function have? These are points at which the directionality of the graph changes. Either the graph changes from an increasing to a decreasing uh, behavior at that point, or changes from a decreasing to an increasing behavior. So how many turning points can the graph of a polynomial function have? Um, and probably the most valuable sort of technique, tool, approach, um, sort of thing for your for your quiver of arrows that you can use to uh, to do analysis. We're going to talk about sign charts today. Um, this is a super duper useful technique uh, that we can use for analyzing polynomials. Yes, but also we'll use it for analyzing rational functions when we get there in the second half of this chapter. Um, and you'll use sign charts in calculus um, to do. Very similar things to what we're doing here, but you're going to be able to apply it to some different sort of rate of change kind of questions. Um, 
for example, in calculus, you're going to be able to use a sign chart to determine what kind of a turning point a function has. Is the turning point going to be a maximum or is it going to be a minimum, a local maximum, the top of a hill, a local minimum, the bottom of a valley? You can use a sign chart to help quantify that in calculus as well. This is maybe the first time that you've used something like a sign chart, but this is one of these really underrated tools. Uh, and it's probably the most valuable thing I want you to come away with uh, from today's uh, video. Um, and really, at the end of the day, what sign charts are, what, what we need most, I guess, in order to effectively use sign charts, is we need to be able to understand a polynomial in its factored form. We talked about the sum when we were introduced to quadratic functions back in the day, way back in chapter one, um, because having the factored form of a quadratic function allowed us to really quickly get information about that quadratic function out of the expression that defines it. In particular, the factored form of a quadratic told me exactly what the zeros, the roots of that quadratic uh, uh, function were. And the same is going to be true for us with polynomial functions as well. If we can get it in its factored form, we're going to be able to learn a lot more about it than when it comes to us in its standard form. So first things first. Um, what is a polynomial and what are some of the key features that polynomial functions enjoy? So this function we're looking at on the screen right now is an example of a polynomial function. Uh, and just to get our terminology down, um, polynomial, um, poly is the, the Greek prefix here that means many. Um, nomial uh, kind of means names or things or something. So polynomials means a, an expression or a function that is built on an expression that has many different terms in it. And when I use the word terms, what I mean is many different expressions added and subtracted together. And in particular, the kinds of expressions that we're adding and subtracting to one another to get polynomials are expressions that are called monomials. So one piece or one name in the Greek. Um, and a monomial is nothing more than a positive integer power of x, or possibly a zero, so non-negative integer power of x, um, possibly also multiplied by a real number coefficient sitting out in front of it. So like 2x squared, that's an example of a monomial. Negative 5x cubed, that's a monomial. And when I add monomials together, the result is called a polynomial. Um, so that's all that polynomials are. It's what we get when we add a bunch of non-negative integer powers of x together, possibly multiplied by real number coefficients. That's it. So this function, defined by the expression we're looking at right here, this is an example of a polynomial function. And so we can ask questions about this function, uh, like the questions we would ask about any function. What are its x-intercepts? What are its y-intercepts? What's its y-intercept? Does it have a y-intercept? What's its domain? Uh, what does the end behavior look like? Uh, what does the graph look like in general? What are sort of the, the macro scale properties that this function and its graph would have? So let's start, let's, let's try to address some of those questions. And what I would recommend us doing here first is let's just take the, you know, the technological approach uh, and figure out what would happen if we just graphed this thing. Uh, if I just graph this, what is it going to end up uh, looking like at the end of the day? Uh, so I'm going to quickly just add a graphing window onto our screen so we can kind of look at both of these at the same time. Uh, whoops, that's not the right thing. Try that again, sorry. There we go. All right, so I'm going to try to arrange these windows so we can see them both real quickly. There we go. All right, so if I just want a graph of this function, I can use technology to do that. I'm just going to type it into my Desmos window, f of x equals negative 5x to the power 3 plus 2x to the power 2 minus x minus 4. And so what I get here is something that, you know, it looks like a graph. Um, it, this graph has sort of a, a basic shape that we can talk about. It looks kind of like a flattened out S shape a little bit. Um, you know, one thing that I notice is that this graph definitely has uh, a Y intercept, a vertical intercept. It's here at zero comma negative four. Um, it also has an X intercept, but it doesn't seem like the X coordinate of that intercept is something obvious. It's something like negative 0 0.751. Hard for me to tell based on the formula for this function uh, why I would expect the X intercept to have that particular value. Um, but the Y intercept, negative 4, 
Well, that looks like something that maybe we can spot directly from the formula for this function. Um, but also the basic shape is kind of interesting, right? Um, it looks kind of like a straight line in the macro scale. If we zoom way out on this thing, uh, and then maybe I'll just change my x-axis here real quickly. Let me make it just negative 6 to 6. Um, but if I zoom way out on this, we notice that the end behavior of this function seems pretty predictable. As x goes to negative infinity, as we go to the, uh, the westmost horizon on this graph, f of x is going to positive infinity. Right? It's blowing up. It's crashing through the ceiling as we go toward the left end of the graph. And conversely, as we go toward the right end of the graph, my graph is crashing through the floor. So here the end behavior as x goes to positive infinity, f of x is going to negative infinity. So we should think about what is it about the formula for this function uh, that could have given us that information. Um, and then also, just thinking about the basic shape. right? This graph doesn't appear to have any turning points at all. It looks as though this graph is always decreasing. Right? As we go from left to right on the graph, we are always going from higher values to lower values. There's never a place where this graph stops decreasing and starts increasing again. Right? There's no turning points, evidently, uh, in this graph. It is always on a downward slope is another way we can think about that. So that's the basic shape of this polynomial function. Um, but when we move forward into the, the preview activity for this section, uh, it sort of walks us through a, an exploration of some more of these key features in a way that I think helps us to wrestle with these questions uh, in, in a way that's really helpful. Okay. So let's take a look at what some of these key features are. Sorry. All right. So what it does for us is it gives us this link to another sort of Desmos exploration, which I'm going to bring up here on the screen uh, once again, just right next to right next to what we're working on. Uh, oh, where'd it go? Here we go. So here is the Desmos worksheet uh, that's being referred to at this link. So again, you can access this worksheet for yourself just by going to our online textbook and clicking on this link that's a part of this preview activity. And so in this activity, what they're doing for us um, is they're giving us what we might call a general equation for a fourth order, fourth degree polynomial. Now I've kind of given away one of the terms that we're about to talk about. Um, but what you'll notice is that the equation for this um, polynomial has a term a sub 0, uh, which is just a constant. It doesn't have any powers of x in it. And then it also has a term in it that has x to the power 1, x to the power 2, x to the power 3, and then a term with x to the power 4. Okay, So there are really five different terms that are a part of the expression that defines this function. Um, and what's great about this Desmos worksheet is it allows you to change the values of those uh, coefficients, so the a0, a1, a2, the things we're multiplying the powers of x by, we have sliders in Desmos that let us change those things around. So for example, if I just want to change this value of a0, I can take this slider, move it around, and we can see what's happening to the graph. By the way, this is something that is predictable. You know, the, the way that this particular parameter is changing the graph of this function is something we would have expected way back from our graph transformations work that we did way back in chapter one, because after all, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just going to move my chair in a little bit. Um, when you add a constant uh, to a function, the effect that adding a constant onto a function has on its graph is it affects a vertical shift. Upward if we increase the, the value that we're adding, downward if we decrease the value that I'm adding. So that coefficient has a predictable effect on the graph of the function. What happens if I change the coefficient on x? So a1 times x. If I change the coefficient of x, what's going to happen? Well, now things get a little bit more interesting, right? We're kind of, at least it looks like, we're kind of changing the shape of this graph in some interesting ways, right? If I have a small value for this, like if I have a1 equals 0, it looks like we have a nice U shape. It almost looks like a parabola. It's not quite symmetric, according to the graph that I'm seeing here, um, but it's pretty close. But if I skew this away from 0, it looks like we get sort of less and less symmetric. It's almost like we get more V-shaped. And depending on whether that a1 is positive or negative, that V shape appears in the left half plane of the xy plane or the right half plane. Um, so that's kind of an interesting effect. What about the x squared coefficient? What happens if I change that? This is a wonderful worksheet um, because it really gives you a sense of 
it's almost like when I when I play around with this, I what occurs to me is how much I don't know about the effects that each one of these coefficients, the coefficient of x, the coefficient of x squared, and so on, the effects that those have on the shape of this graph seem like they're very different. Here I'm changing the x cubed coefficient. And a lot remains the same, but some stuff remains different. Um, and if I keep tweaking this eventually, maybe I can make one of these turning points go away. Maybe? Yeah, it looks like maybe I made this turning point over here on the right go away by making this big enough. And now we have a turning point again. All right. um, and then what about the x to the fourth coefficient? Oh, that's interesting. So here it looks like we have a w shape that's pointing upward. Whereas if I bend this down to a negative value, now it looks like I have a w shape that's opening downward. So there's a lot of different effects that changing these coefficients can have. And so it's really hard to think about them one at a time. But um, the first thing that I want to observe uh, about all of these graphs, what all of these graphs have in common, whoops, I'm going to actually turn off my, I'm going to turn off my axes for just a second. And we're just going to think about what the shape of these graphs look like. What all of these graphs seem like they have in common, regardless of where I set the values of these various parameters. Well, I guess this parameter is, a, is an exception. Um, but they all seem to have this basic shape um, that's the same, right? It's kind of a w-like shape when my coefficient of x to the fourth is positive, and it's an upside-down w-like shape when my coefficient of x to the fourth is negative, and it also looks like an m. Again, depending on where I'm setting these other values, that can change the number of turning points that we have. Um, and so the first thing that I want to sort of surface in this discussion uh, is just what is the the role. Maybe I'll add my axes back in here for a second. So here's my x-axis back in the picture. Um, the first question here asks, what's the largest number of distinct points at which this graph can cross the x-axis? So in this example, it looks like we have two points at which my graph is crossing the x-axis. But if I change these parameter values, I can actually make it cross in more than two points. See, now it's crossing in these four different spots. I don't want to have to try to find the actual decimal numbers of, of, the, of the coordinates of these points, but we can make it cross four times. Uh, we can make it cross less than four times, as we could see, right? We could shift this upward, and now it only crosses twice. We could potentially sort of move this down just enough that it sort of crosses the x-axis three times, once there, once there, so it's a touch and go, and then once there as well. Um, and conceivably, we could also shift this whole thing downward just enough so that it only touches once. Right? It does a touch and go right here, and then you know, sort of continues along. But if we keep sliding this down, now we're in a situation where it doesn't cross the x-axis at all anymore. Um, and so it looks as though we have a whole range of different numbers of x-intercepts that this graph can have, anywhere from no x-intercepts up to 1, 2, 3, or 4 x-intercepts. But it doesn't seem as though it can cross more than four times. So the largest number of distinct points at which p of x can cross the x-axis appears to be four. And that is a quantity that we call the degree of a polynomial. It's a little bit of a backwards way in which mathematicians would typically define the degree of a polynomial. Typically, the way that we would define such a thing is define it to be something that we can spot directly from the polynomial itself. And if we did it that way, we would say that 4 is the degree of my polynomial because it also happens to be the highest exponent of any of my monomial terms. Right? I have a term with x to the power 0, that's the constant term. I have a term with x to the power 1, x to the power 2, x to the power 3, and x to the power 4. But I don't have x to the power 5, 6, 7, and so forth. Right? So that highest exponent that's uh, present in our polynomial expression, that highest exponent is what we'll call the degree. But according to this exercise up here, it looks as though there's a relationship between the degree of a polynomial and the largest number of times that its graph can cross the x-axis. It's the same thing as the largest number of different x values that can make p of x, or f of x, or whatever we're calling my function here. I guess it's p of x. It's the largest number of distinct solutions to p of x equals 0 that can exist. After all, p of x equals 0 for exactly those x at which the graph of p of x 
crosses the x-axis. So the number of x-intercepts is the same as the number of zeros of my function, um, and that appears to be no more than the degree of the polynomial. And that is a fact that is so important in algebra that it gets called the fundamental theorem of algebra. So I want to just call that out here real quickly. This is probably, as far as mathematics is concerned, one of the most foundational uh, facts, and most foundational truths in all of mathematics. Um, and it reads like this, the fundamental theorem of algebra. Fundamental theorem of algebra. So it says this, if p of x is a polynomial function, so if it's the kind of function built on an expression which is a sum and difference of monomials, positive non-negative integer powers of x, so the kind we're talking about today, and if the degree of that polynomial function is a number, let's call that number k. So in our example that we're talking about here, the role of k is being played by 4, because that's the highest uh, exponent in my expression that defines p of x. The fundamental theorem of algebra concludes that p of x equals 0 for, at most, k distinct values of x. Distinct values. So again, we can think of this as the number of x-intercepts that the graph of p of x has. The fundamental theorem of algebra says that the degree of a polynomial controls the upper bound on that number of x-intercepts. If you hand me a polynomial of degree 26, I can tell you that there is no way that the graph of that polynomial function will cross the x-axis more than 26 times. It could cross the x-axis less than 26 times, but it cannot cross the x-axis any more than 26 times. Right? So the fundamental theorem of algebra provides an upper bound, an upper limit. There is no way, for example, that the graph of a polynomial of degree 4 can cross the x-axis 5 times, or 12 times, or 18 times. But it could cross 4 times, and it might cross 3, 2, 1, or even 0. But it cannot cross more than 4. That's the content of the fundamental theorem of algebra. And the fundamental theorem of algebra is called that just because it is so important a result, uh, just mathematically and historically speaking, um, because it's one of these results that tells us a very general statement about solving a, a whole class of different kinds of equations. It doesn't tell us how to solve those equations, and that's probably the most unfortunate thing about polynomials. Uh, it continues to make polynomials a subject that mathematicians still do active research in uh, up until this day. Um, so it doesn't tell us how to solve polynomial equations, but it tells us how many solutions those equations can have. They cannot have any more solutions than the degree of that polynomial. All right, so that actually addresses the first two uh, questions that are here in, in part A and B. Um, that the fundamental theorem of algebra tells me that we can't have more x-intercepts or more solutions to the equation p of x equals 0 than the degree of the polynomial. So let's move forward and talk about turning points. That's the next piece of the, the puzzle here in this activity. Let's see, based on the, the graph that we're working with here, how many turning points can the graph of a, a fourth degree polynomial have? So bringing my graph back onto the screen here for a second, what do we mean by turning points? Again, a turning point is defined as a place where the graph of my function changes direction. It either changes from increasing to decreasing, or vice versa, it changes from decreasing to increasing. So when we go looking for turning points on a graph, we're looking for the tops of mountains, and we're also looking for the bottoms of valleys. Each one of those is going to be what we call a turning point. So on this graph, when I go looking for turning points, I'm going to find one right here at the top of this hill. I'm going to find one down here at the bottom of this valley. And I'm going to find one more up here uh, at the top of this hill. I'm going to hide the x-axis now because I actually don't want to care about x-intercepts anymore. I just care about turning points. And so here's an example of a fourth degree polynomial function that has a total of three turning points. I've marked all three of them. We would call this first turning point here uh, a local maximum because it's the top of a hill, right? On either side of that turning point, 
my function, if I were to move away from that point, I would be decreasing sort of on either side. If I move to the, to the left, I would decrease. If I move to the right, I would decrease. But more concretely, usually the way we'd say this, is a local maximum is a place where my function changes from one which is increasing from left to right to one which is decreasing from left to right. Local maximum. Same thing for this third one of my turning points. I would also call that a local maximum uh, because it's a place where my graph changes from increasing on the left to decreasing on the right. A local minimum, by contrast, is what we would call the bottom of a valley, such as this turning point right here. It's a place where my graph goes from decreasing on the left to increasing on the right. So here we have an example of a fourth degree polynomial. Uh, and the graph of this fourth degree polynomial happens to have three turning points. Can we make this fourth degree polynomial function, this general fourth degree polynomial function, have a different number of turning points? Does it always have three? Or by changing these coefficients, can I make it have a different number of turning points? Well, I don't seem to be able to do that by changing the value of the constant coefficient, because after all, that just affects a vertical shift. And vertically shifting, my polynomial function is not going to change how many turning points that it has. So I should probably try changing some of the other coefficients that we have here. What if I change the coefficient of x to the power 1? Well, that does seem to change the basic shape of this graph in some important ways. In fact, if you look at the two turning points on the right, it looks like as I decrease this value of the, the x to the first power coefficient, my turning points on the right are getting closer and closer together. Right? This local min and local max that are up here are getting closer and closer to one another. And if I decrease that x to the first power enough, it looks like we lose, in fact, both of those turning points. I no longer have any place in here where my graph is going from decreasing to increasing or vice versa. Now we just have a slippery decreasing slope the whole way through. And so this is still the graph of a fourth degree polynomial function. And yet it no longer has three turning points. In fact, it only seems to have this one this local maximum here at the top of the mountain, but the two other turning points that we had down here before are no longer there. One of the things that's interesting about this is we can kind of see that turning points appear to sort of emerge and disappear in pairs. Right? We went from having three turning points in this example to now having only one turning point. And there was no place in the middle where we can somehow get two turning points. Right? Um, and that's potentially an important observation for later on. Right? Three turning points here, and suddenly one turning point here. So it looks like we can have three turning points. We could have one turning point. Can we have zero turning points? Eh, it certainly doesn't look like, based on the adjustments that we're making here. It looks like there always has to be some turning point. And one of the reasons that there always has to be some turning point for this function uh, is about its end behavior. And we will talk about its end behavior next. So it looks like those are the two options. Right? We can have three turning points. We could have one turning point. Can we have more than three turning points? Turns out that the answer to that is no. And again, for a reason to that, I'm going to go back to the fundamental theorem of algebra. One of the things that you'll discover next semester in calculus is that the number of turning points that a function has is governed by the number of x-intercepts, or the number of zeros, of an associated function called the rate of change function or the derivative function of our original p of x. Right? And so because that function is also a polynomial, its number of zeros, which is the same as the number of turning points of our original function, is governed by the fundamental theorem of algebra as well. And so what we can say in calculus, we'll be able to see why this is true on a, on a more firm foundation, um, but what we, what, what we can conjecture right now is that the number of turning points cannot be any larger. So the number of turning points is going to be at most not k, the degree, which was 4 in this example, but 1 fewer than the degree, k minus 1. Right? So my degree was 4, k minus 1 is going to be 3 in this example. So we cannot have any more than 3 turning points. And then the other piece of our conjecture that I was kind of hinting at is that the number of turning points because they appear and disappear in pairs, the number of turning points is always going to have the same parity, evenness or oddness, as k minus 1. Must have the same even odd parity as the number k minus 1 as k minus 1. 
So if you hand me a 26th degree polynomial, I know that we can't have more than 25 turning points in its graph, but we could have 23 or 21 or 19 or 17 or 15 or 13 or 11 or 9 or 5 or 7 or 3 or 1. Right, so those are all the different possibilities for the number of turning points that we can have for a polynomial of degree 26. Right? So you start from one less than the degree, that's the most number of turning points that you can have, and then you sort of skip count by twos going downward to figure out. So we had a fourth degree polynomial, can't have more than three turning points, but it could have one turning point, because those turning points appear and disappear in pairs. That's a subject, by the way, to get off on a really bizarre tangent. That's a subject that mathematicians study in, in a greater level of, of uh, generality and complexity in a, in a theory called Morse theory. Uh, it's one of my favorite theories in, in all of mathematics, where you ask questions about the turning points, what are called the critical points of general functions. Um, and they appear and disappear in pairs. And that tells me something about the, the shape of space. Uh, it's very very interesting theory to get into. And it's a good uh, sort of undergraduate research uh, area and topic, if that's something you're interested in down the line. So that tells me something about the turning points. I mentioned that the uh, fourth degree polynomial, for example, like the one we're looking at, there's no way for it to have less than one turning point. Because what does a function that has no turning point look like? A function that has no turning point is always returning from the same place that it originated. So let me see if I can, yeah, here's, here's a graph of a function that has no turning point at all, right? Um, it is always increasing, right? It's going from uh, bottom to top as we move from left to right. So here's a function with no turning point. But the fact that it has no turning point, so if I have a function that never changes direction, that means that we know for sure that whichever infinity it originated from when it started at the leftmost horizon of my graph, it will have to return to a different infinity when we go to the easternmost horizon of the graph. Right? This function's end behavior, as x approaches negative infinity, my function is approaching negative infinity. And as x approaches positive infinity, my function is approaching positive infinity, it returns to a different infinity from whence it came, right? um, because it had no turning points. But it could only have no turning points if 0 were a possible value for the number of turning points. And so 0 would have to be the same evenness or oddness as 1 minus the degree. And if 0 has, the, so 0 is an even number, so 1 minus the degree, the degree, sorry, the degree minus 1 has to be even. So the degree would have to be odd. Right? So that there's no way for a function to have no turning points unless its polynomial function have no turning points, unless its degree were an odd number. And in the case of fourth degree polynomials, the only way to make its degree odd is to wipe out this fourth degree term by making the coefficient of x to the power 4 equal to 0, the way that I've done here in, in my Desmos worksheet. So in fact, this is no longer a degree 4 polynomial at all because we've erased that fourth power altogether. It has no term with x to the power 4 in it. So the degree is actually 3. And so it can have up to three x-intercepts, and it can have two turning points, as, for example, this one does. Or it could have no turning points at all, because again, turning points appear and disappear in pairs when we change parameter values. right? So here's an example with no turning points. So it appears that there's something about the degree that tells us about the uh, end behavior of our polynomials as well. So let's move on to talk about end behavior next. So how do we know what the end behavior of a polynomial function is going to do? Well, here's the, the real key to this. And this is why we spent so much time talking about individual powers of x in, in, last, uh, in the last class's video, the one that came out on Monday. Um, I want to return to just a generic sort of specific example of a polynomial function right here. f of x equals minus 5 x to the third plus 2 x squared minus x minus 4. And so I want to ask a question like, what is the end behavior of this function as x goes to plus infinity? What about minus infinity? All right, so there's, there's what I'm interested in answering here. Well, here's the thing, right? If we imagine sort of plugging a very large number in for x. Let me again use 800, 867.5309. So this is a large number, 8 million or whatever. Right? If we just, you know, we could do this in our mind's eye if we wanted to, but let's, let's just do it with technology for a moment. 
if we were just to stuff this 8 million plus number in here for x and then evaluate. Whoa, uh, we get some really gigantic number here because when I take the third power of that, it's going to be ginormous. Multiply that by negative 5 is going to be negative ginormous. I'm going to raise this number to the second power and then multiply it by 2. So you can see, right, we're going to have a lot of uh, sort of work to do here, a lot of evaluation. Let's just finish it out just because, you know, let's start, finish what we started here. So multiply this out, multiply that by 2, uh, and then subtract 8675309, and then subtract 4 from that, add that to this number. So I get some really, really large number, right? This is uh, approximately, you know, negative 3 with 21 more places before we hit the decimal, uh, the actual decimal after it, right? Um, so this is a very, very large negative number. So that's one way of sort of thinking about the end behavior, but it's really sort of a clumsy way to think about it. Um, because for one thing, oh, I gotta try to get back to where I was before. It doesn't look like it's gonna let me do that. I uh, hope I didn't lose, ah, here it is. <laughs> didn't lose my function altogether from my palette here. What I would rather do is I would rather do some algebra that helps to illuminate that without having to do difficult large numerical calculations, right? So let's figure out a way to do that. What algebra could I do that could illuminate what's happening, right? The real secret in, in how to, to make this more comprehensible is I want to see whatever, I want to take all that blowing up large to infinity behavior that's happening, and I want to exchange it for shrinking down to zero behavior instead. Uh, and so that's going to be the key. I'm going to come back in just 30 seconds and we'll take a look at how that works. So just give me 30 and I'll be back in just a minute. So how do we understand the end behavior of a polynomial function? We use an algebraic, and it's not really a trick. I don't want to call it a trick. It's an insight uh, that is going to uh, let us take all of that blowing up to infinity behavior that makes it difficult to think about the ends of a function and exchange it out for shrinking down to zero behavior, because zero is a number that we can do uh, arithmetic with a lot more simply. So um, here's the trick. I'm going to look in this polynomial function and take the highest power of x that I can find, the power of x which determines the degree of my polynomial function. That's this x to the power 3. And I'm just going to divide out my x to the power 3 on both sides. Now, why would I do that? Here's the reason that I want to do that. Um, the reason I want to do that is that now we can take a look at the other terms that are over here on this side. And they're all going to have something in common. Um, 4 divided by x to the third, let's take a, let's think about that term first. 4 divided by x to the third power, as x gets very, very large, 4 divided by x to the third power is going to be 4 divided by a really gigantic number. It's like we have four pizzas to divide up equally among an increasingly large number of people that we have to feed. How much pizza is each person, each individual person going to get? That amount of pizza that each individual person gets is going to collapse down to zero. And so there's the, the key insight is that rather than having a bunch of terms that sort of blow up on the right-hand side to infinity, now I'm going to have some terms like 4 over x to the third power that actually is going to be replaced by 0 as x gets larger and larger and larger. And the same is going to be true for minus x over x to the third, which is the same as x to the minus 2, or another way to say it is 1 over x squared, right? That's going to have the same feature. As x goes to positive infinity, that is also going to shrink down to 0. And so we're not going to have to worry about it x squared over x to the third, same story, right? That's going to just be 2 over x, which is also, as x gets very, very large, that's going to go to 0. And then I have this negative 5 that's sitting out on the front. And that negative 5 is just going to stay negative 5. No matter whether x goes to you know, plus infinity, minus infinity, it's just going to keep doing its thing, right? So here's the, 
here's how we sort of reconcile all the information that we just had about the end behavior of this thing. What we can say is that the larger that x gets, the less that these terms, the 2 over x, the minus 1 over x squared, the minus 4 over x cubed, the less that those things are going to matter. And so 4 over x cubed, we can just sort of forget about it. Um, 2 over x, we're just going to sort of forget about it. 1 over x squared, we're going to forget about it. And so it's going to look an awful lot like f of x over x to the power 3 is equal to negative 5. So as x gets very large, this is what my function is going to look like. It's just going to look like negative 5 when I divide it by x to the power 3. Or, maybe better still, let's move this x to the power 3 back to the other side. So here's the moral of the story. The end behavior of f of x is governed by what we call the leading term, negative uh, 5 x to the power 3. Right? As x gets very large, this negative 5 x to the power 3 is going to be the term that matters the most in this polynomial. And the other terms are going to be negligible in comparison. Because when I divide by x to the third, they become terms which, as x goes to infinity, vanish down to 0. So any question about the end behavior of a function, we can answer by ignoring all but the leading term of my polynomial, which in this example is minus 5x to the power 3. And as we talked about on Monday, we can classify the end behavior of that function. As x goes to positive infinity, f of x is going to look like something that's negative 5 times a very large positive number. So f of x is going to approach minus infinity. And that's the end behavior uh, as x approaches positive infinity for this function. And then by the same token, as x approaches minus infinity, f of x is going to look like negative 5 times a very large negative number raised to the third power. And when I raise it to the and uh, when I raise a negative number to an odd power, the result is still negative. And so this is going to be negative 5 times a very large negative number, which is going to be a very large positive number. f of x is going to approach positive infinity. So all of our intuition about the end behavior of single powers of x is exactly what's coming in handy here. We can determine the end behavior of a polynomial function by looking just at the leading term, the term that has the highest power of x in it, and answering what is the end behavior of that function. And the end behavior of that function will be exactly the same as the end behavior of the polynomial on the whole. And we saw that in the, the graph for, uh, well, I guess we should look at the graph of this function again. It's the graph that we sort of started with, right? That was this graph right here. I'm going to scroll it back up. This was the graph of uh, uh, Sorry, it was a graph of the function that we that we started out with here in the very beginning. There we go. Here's a graph of this function, right? Um, and sure enough, as x goes to negative infinity, the value of f of x is going to positive infinity. So that's the end behavior. It's crashing through the ceiling as we go to the left end of the xy coordinate system. And conversely, as we go to the right end of the coordinate system, it's crashing through the floor. And that's all there is to it. So the end behavior uh, for a polynomial function is governed entirely by its leading term. And if we remember what, uh, how to classify the end behavior for a single power of x, then we know everything that we need to know about the end behavior for a polynomial function. So it's from there that I want to take our last pivot for today's meeting and start talking about how better to understand polynomials using their factored form. And in their factored form, we'll be able to also talk about uh, sign charts and what a sign chart can do to help us understand the behavior of a polynomial function on a, on a both a local and also sort of a global basis. So I want to do that motivated by the second activity that's a part of this section. So here we're given a polynomial function, and it's given to us in a very different looking format than we got polynomial functions previously. Um, and I kind of want to riff on that for just a moment. So remember, one of the biggest limitations that we have about, uh, about the standard form of a polynomial function, when we have all the terms listed out like this, 
Um, we can do things like spot the degree. The degree of this polynomial function is 4. We can discuss the end behavior, because that's going to be the end behavior of this leading term, 2x to the power 4. So as x goes to plus infinity, it's going to go to plus infinity. And as x goes to minus infinity, it's also going to go to plus infinity, because the degree is even. It returns from the same infinity that it originates. right? Uh, and because the coefficient is positive, it's going to open upward like this. right? But that's as much as we can say based on the standard form of this polynomial. The thing that we would not want to try to do is we would not want to try and, for example, uh, oops, I would not want to try and uh, set this equal to 0 and solve for x, right? Because we don't have, I mean, a formula exists, but I don't know it off the top of my head, and it's really nasty, and nobody uses it. There's a formula like the quadratic formula that can let us solve any polynomial equation with degree 4, called the quartic formula. But it's a, a, it's a nasty disaster, and no one wants to use it uh, unless they absolutely have to. Um, so is there a better way to solve the equation f of x equals 2x to the fourth plus 10x da, 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 equals 0? Well, there is a better way. But the better way relies on us being able to factor the polynomial that's on the right-hand side. And factoring is an equally challenging problem to setting this thing equal to 0 and solving it, because the two problems are completely the same. Um, but if we could magically factor this thing, how would we do it? Maybe I would factor a 2 out of everything. And then maybe I would take some of those uh, terms in the middle and kind of split them into some pieces. right? So I took my x cubed and I split it magically into a negative 4 and a 9. Um, and then maybe I could split the x to the power 2s in a sort of a similar fashion. All right, let me scroll over a little bit here. Um, and through a series of other manipulations, continuing to split out these terms. Oh, boy, this is really its going to give me some hassle. Here. Let me zoom out on it. Through a series of algebraic manipulations, if we get super lucky, we could factor this thing out completely. And if I could factor it out completely, now we would be in business. Right? Because now, if this thing has been factored completely, I can take each one of these factors, set it individually equal to 0, and solve for x. Right? I could take x plus 4 equals 0. I could solve that for x. Um, I could solve x minus 2 squared equals 0. I could solve that thing for x. Um, and I could split out the x plus 5, solve that x equals 0. right? So I could solve, whoops, the x plus 5 is behind my head. Let me move it over here. I could solve each one of these simpler equations for x. right? Just have to move this 4 to the other side, x equals negative 4. Um, take the square root on both sides, plus or minus the square root of 0. Well, square root of 0 is 0, plus minus 0 is 0. Um, I can ditch these parentheses, add 2 to both sides, x equals 2. Subtract 5 from both sides, x equals negative 5. So this right here, what we're looking at on the screen, this is the beauty of having the factored form of a polynomial, is that each of its individual factors can tell me one of the zeros, or the x-intercepts of the graph, that this polynomial function has. So if we have the factored form, it tells us the zeros. All we have to do is use this zero factor property. Take each of the factors, give it its own equal to 0, and then solve. Okay. That's the, the magic of having the factored form. So let's go over to this activity from the text. Here, the polynomial p of x is given to us in a form that's already been factored. And so from this, we can get the zeros fairly readily. Let's do that process. What are the individual factors that make up my p of x? Well, here I have a factor of x plus 1,520. I also have a factor sitting next to it, x squared plus 10,000. I've got a factor sitting next to that, x minus 3471 squared. And then I have a factor sitting next to that, x minus 9738. So if I want to know what the zeros of this function are, all I have to do is take each one of those factors and set it individually equal to 0. So for example, x plus 1520 equals 0. And when I solve that by subtracting 1520 from both sides, I'll get x equals negative 1,520. Same story for the second factor, x squared plus 10,000. x squared plus 10,000. Set that equal to 0 and try and solve. Subtract 10,000 from both sides, negative 10,000 equals x squared. Take the square root, x equals plus or minus the square root of negative 10,000. But here is a place 
at which we kind of have to stop and say, this doesn't work. There's no real solution here. Because the square root of a negative number, a negative real number, is not real. There's an imaginary solution to this, but we're not going to bother with that for the sake of our course. We'll just say that this equation has no real solutions. And so this green factor here, x squared plus 10,000, does not contribute any zeros or x-intercepts to this polynomial function. So we'll keep going. What about the next factor? x minus 3471, the quantity squared, equals 0. So here the first step would be I want to take the square root on both sides. I'll get plus or minus the square root of 0. And the nice thing about plus or minus the square root of 0 is that that's not undefined. In fact, it's not even two different values. It's just 0. And so when I add 3, 4, 7, 1 to both sides, I find that x equals 34, 71 is another one of the zeros of this function. And last but not least, x minus 9, 7, 3, 8 equals 0. And so when I add 9, 7, 3, 8 to both sides, I find out that the third 0 of this function is 9,738. So this function has three different zeros, negative 1520, 3,471, and 9,738. So there's three zeros, and that's what they are. Um, what can I say about the degree of this? Well, one way of figuring that out would be to just do out all the algebra and multiply out all these factors. I certainly don't want to do that. And if the mathematician doesn't want to do that, chances are you probably don't want to do it either. So let's just do it as a thought experiment, uh, and that will, be, that will be enough for us. Let's imagine what would happen if we did multiply out all of these powers of x. What would be the highest exponent that I would get? Well, to get my highest exponent, I would have to multiply the x from this factor by the x squared from this factor by the x from this factor twice by the x from this factor. So if I add all those exponents together, I'll get 1x from here, 2 more from there to make 3, 2 more from there to make 5, 1 more from there that would make 6. And so the highest power of x that we could possibly get is going to be x to the power 6. And so that's the degree of this polynomial function. What about the end behavior? Now that we know that the degree of this polynomial is even, we know that its graph is going to return from the same infinity from which it originates. So it's either going to have a basic sort of U shape, where it originates from positive infinity and returns to positive infinity, or it's going to have a basic upside down U shape, where it originates at negative infinity and it returns to negative infinity. Which one it is depends on the leading term, the coefficient of that x to the power 6. Is x to the power 6 going to be multiplied by a positive number or a negative number? And the only place where a coefficient for x to the 6 is going to have come from is from this 4,692 out in the front. So my leading term, to come back to what we were talking about before, my leading term is going to be 4,692 times x to the power 6. And there's going to be a bunch of other terms if we did all this multiplication out, which we're not going to do. But the end behavior is governed by the leading term. And so my function looks like 4,692x to the power 6. And so as x becomes large and positive, p of x is going to become large and positive also. p of x goes to plus infinity. And as x becomes large and negative, p of x becomes large and positive. So it's originating from positive infinity, and it's returning to positive infinity at the end of the day. So that's the end behavior for this function, because it has even degree, and that leading term has a positive coefficient. OK, so what we want to do now, now that we have all this information, I want to start piecing this information together to sketch a graph of this function. And that's the process in which we use this magic tool that I've been promising called a sign chart. So I want to use our last 10 minutes to talk about how to construct a sign chart that can help us to understand what the basic shape of this graph is going to end up looking like. So the idea behind a sign chart is that in the factored form, we know now when each of these different factors that make up my expression for p of x, uh, we can tell exactly when those factors become 0. So let's take our x plus 1520, right? That factor became 0 at x equals negative 1520. Negative 1520. When x is negative 1520, this term became 0. And then we had a similar analysis for the other terms uh, that were a part of this expression. x squared plus 10,000, that thing actually never became 0. And since that term never becomes 0, sorry, that factor, I'm just going to kind of not list anything for it right now. 
x minus 3, 4, 7, 1, the quantity squared, we saw that that factor became 0 at x equals positive 3,471. So over here, positive 3, 4, 7, 1. That's when that term is going to become 0. And then x minus 9, 7, 3, 8, my last factor over here on the right-hand side, that becomes 0 at x equals 9,738. My number line over here is not exactly to scale, but I hope you'll forgive that for today. So that term becomes 0 there. OK, so now let's think about, I'm going to extend these lines real quick. Now that we know where each of these factors becomes 0, what that kind of does for us is it kind of divides up my number line into these different regimes. right? It gives me a regime in between 37, 3471 and 9738, and then another regime between negative 1520 and 3471, and then I have a regime on either side of that minimum and that maximum. Right? So I kind of have what I'm going to think of as four different chunks of the real number line that I need to think about. And I want to answer the question, for the x values that are in those chunks, so chunk 1 is this one, chunk 2 is this one, chunk 3 is that one, chunk 4 is this one, at the x values in those chunks, is p of x, is the value of my function going to be positive, or is the value of my function going to be negative? That's all I care about. I don't care about the specific numbers. I'm not going to do any hard arithmetic. I'm just going to ask, is this number going to be positive, or is this number going to be negative? And what emerges out of this is going to be what we call a sign chart for my function. And the beauty is, we can do that just by looking at the signs, the positivity or negativity, of each of the factors that make up this expression. Let's start with the easiest one, the number 4,692. The number 4,692 is a positive number. And whether or not it is positive does not depend on the value of x. So 4,692, that's always positive. We don't have to worry about the value of x as far as determining the sign of, of that piece. What about the next factor, x plus 1520? If I take an x value that's less than negative 1520, so x equals negative 10,000, something way over here, right? then when I add 1520 to it, my result is still going to be negative. So x plus 1520 for the values of x that are less than negative 1520 is going to be a negative number. But for all the values of x that are greater than negative 1520, my sign changes to positive. So this factor is negative to the left of negative 1520 on the number line and positive everywhere to the right of 1520 on the real number line. So now my sign chart is starting to emerge. What about x squared plus 10,000? That thing was never equal to 0. And the reason it's never equal to 0 is that anytime I put a, anytime I take a real number x and I square it, that result is always non-negative. So when I add 10,000 to it, the result is always going to be a positive number. So x squared plus 10,000 is always, always positive, regardless of the value of x. So we'll just put pluses everywhere down the column for x squared plus 10,000. Actually, almost the same thing is true for this factor, x minus 3471 squared. For any value of x except for 3471, when I subtract 3471 from it, I'm going to get something non-zero. And when I take a real number that's non-zero and I square it, x minus 3471 is going to be positive. I'm going to be squaring a non-zero real number, and that result is always positive. And then finally, x minus 9738, it's changing sign here at x equals 9738. And for all the x's that are less than 9738, x minus 9738 is going to be negative. So this will be negative here all the way up to 9738. And then after 9738, it becomes positive, and it remains positive for the rest of time. So what this chart is kind of telling me is it's giving me a recipe for if you give me any value of x, let's say x equals, I don't know, 924. 924 is somewhere in between negative 1520 and positive 3471. Right? And so I can read off directly from here. For that value of x, this first factor is positive, the second factor is positive, third factor is positive, fourth factor is positive, fifth factor is negative. So if I multiply all of these together, the sign of that product is going to be positive times positive times positive times positive times a single negative. And that product is therefore going to be negative. This is how we finish up our sign chart. All of those pluses and then a single minus 
is going to give me a negative product. What about up here? If I take a value of x like x equals negative 10,000, p of x is going to be the product of a positive factor, three positive factors, and two negative factors. And the pair of negatives, when I multiply them together, is going to give me a positive result. Times positive, times positive, times positive. That product is going to have a positive value. Between 3471 and 9738, I have four factors that are positive, and again, a single factor that's negative. And so when I multiply all of those together, I get a negative result. And finally, for an x like x equals 72,542, right, it's going to be in my last chunk of the real number line up here. All five of my factors that I'm multiplying together in my expression that defines p of x are going to be positive. So their product, again, will be positive. And now I have a full sign chart for what is happening with my function. My function's values start out as positive. So it's, it's emerging from positive infinity on the left side of my graph, just as we expected it would from its end behavior. And then it crosses the x-axis at x equals negative 15, 20, because p of x goes from positive to negative at that point. And then my function becomes 0 again at x equals 3, 4, 7, 1, but then dips back down into the negatives after that, becoming 0 again at 97, 38, and then becoming positive afterwards. This is a full sign chart for my function. And what it allows me to do, and this is where we're going to wrap up, is it allows me to sketch a basic graph of what this function's graph must look like. So we knew that its x-intercepts were at, I'm going to have to cheat here, negative 15, 20, and 34, 71, and 97, 38. Those were its x-intercepts. And then we knew, based on the sign chart, that p of x was positive in that chunk, negative in that chunk, negative in this chunk, and then positive again in that chunk, and was 0 at each one of these uh, x values. 0 right there, 0 right there, and 0 right there. So those are the places where my graph is going to cross the x-axis. And that p of x is positive over here means that my graph is going to be in the top half plane of the xy plane. It's going to be above the y-axis. So my graph is going to be up here, over there, and then it's going to cross over and become negative. And then here at 3471, my graph is going to come in and touch the x-axis. But it touches the x-axis, but then immediately has to go back down into the negatives. So it turns around at that point. And then, get my head out of the way one last time, uh, after it crosses the x-axis at 97.38, it has to become positive again. And so there's kind of what the pieces of my graph look like, and now all I have to do is kind of connect the, the pieces in between. So this is what the basic shape of the graph of this polynomial function looks like. Um, and what you notice, this is the, the last thing that I want to talk about here, is that the factored form, and here's the the factored form of it one more time, right? The factored form is all that we needed. We didn't have to multiply this whole thing out to be able to get a basic shape of what its graph looks like. The factored form was more than enough to figure this out. Um, the last thing that I want to mention here is uh, what the differences are in the x-intercepts. Here, the x-intercept is a place where my graph crosses the axis. So if I were to zoom in, on this x-intercept. It looks like, if I zoomed in on it, my graph would look kind of like a straight line at that point. And the reason is that my factor, x plus 15, 20, had an exponent on it, a secret exponent, right? Because um, there was nothing actually listed here. But the exponent on that factor was a 1. And that's why, at that point, it looks like we're crossing the axis. Contrast that with what's happening at 3,471. At this point, it's touching the axis and turning around. Touching and turning. And the reason that that's happening there is that x minus 3, 4, 7, 1 has an exponent on it that is not 1, but in fact is 2 in our original function. That's the key difference. Those exponents are what we call the multiplicity of these zeros. So a 0 with a multiplicity of 1 
An x-intercept with a multiplicity of 1 is a place where it looks like we're crossing the x-axis in something that looks kind of like a straight line. Whereas a 0 with a multiplicity 2 looks like we're touching and turning. This thing looks like a parabola. It looks like a y equals x squared kind of graph at that x-intercept. y equals x squared shape. Whereas this looks like a y equals x, a linear equation shape. Right? Um, so the multiplicity is just the power. It's how many times that factor appears in the factored form. Uh, and so just to, just to finish this out for today, um, let's take a quick look at just, you know, again, to reinforce how multiplicity works. I have this nifty little applet that you can play with. So let's suppose that I take up my function f of x and I put in a single factor, I just multiply it by x minus 3. What do, what do I expect is going to happen? I'm going to create an x-intercept where this factor, x minus 3, is equal to 0. In other words, I'm going to create an x-intercept of x equals positive 3. Sure enough, that's exactly what happens, right? This is the graph of f of x equals x minus 3. It has a 0 with a multiplicity of 1, so it looks like a straight line, because in fact, in this example, it is a straight line, as it crosses through the x-axis at x equals 3. What happens if I multiply by x minus 3 again? I'm still going to have an x-intercept at x equals 3, but now it's going to have multiplicity 2. So instead of crossing through the x-axis and looking like a straight line, we're now going to touch and go. Touch the x-axis in turn in something that looks like a parabola, because actually in this example it is again a parabola. What if I multiply by x plus 2? I'm going to create a new x-intercept, this time at x equals negative 2. And that x-intercept has a multiplicity of 1, so it looks like a straight line when it crosses through. But if I multiply by x plus 2 again, I'm still going to have that x-intercept at negative 2, but now it's going to be a touch and go once again. right? It's going to look like a parabola. It touches and turns at the same time because the multiplicity is equal to 2. So having those factors, exposing the factored form of a polynomial function, tells us everything about the x-intercepts, the zeros and their multiplicities of a polynomial function. Where we're going to be able to take this next, in our next couple of sessions, is not just in multiplying by factors like x plus 2, but also in dividing by them. That's going to reduce my x-intercepts from 2 down to 0. But then if I divide by x plus 2 one more time, now I'm not going to create an x-intercept at x equals negative 2. Instead, I'm going to create a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. And we're going to get into a new class of functions that are called the rational functions. And that's where we're going to be able to take this and take this knowledge that we have from today and soup it up one more step. And once we get through rational functions, that's actually going to wrap up our pre-calculus algebraic content for the semester. We still have a couple more trigonometry topics that we have to get to as well. Um, but rational function is going to be our last algebraic hill to climb together. Uh, so we'll do that as we push into next week. We have two class meetings next week. Uh, and then the week after that, um, we just have one uh, because the Monday the 20th is Patriots Day. So I won't be doing a live stream that day. Um, but be on the lookout for... Um, quizzes based on today's material uh, appearing in Canvas over the course of the next couple days. And uh, I hope you're all staying safe and happy and healthy and um, as productive as we can expect ourselves to be. I hope you're also giving yourself a break uh, a lot these days because we all have a lot on our plates. Um, but I hope you're all doing great uh, and I hope to see you again soon.